The RCR shop has great gift ideas. From great looking tees, hoodies, caps, tote bags, bumper stickers and more, the RCR shop is now open at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash shop. George Wood is the former mayor of North Shore City. He's also been an Auckland councillor and is now on a local board. George has forgotten more about local body politics than others have learned. And this promises to be very interesting. He joins me on the line now. Welcome to The Crunch, George. Pleasure to have you here. I haven't spoken to you for a long time, so it's good to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. What's going on at Auckland Council? Well, quite frankly, it's it's a pretty turbulent and, for me, it's somewhat confusing as to uh, trying to get to the bottom of things. But uh, at the moment, everybody's saying that the council's strapped for cash. And I think the mayor coming out in the last few days and saying that uh, uh, the CRL, the Central Rail Link, is going to cost them uh, 100, $160 million per annum uh, from when it, it gets gets going on in um 2026, uh, my, and so that the ratepayers will be up for um, that figure minus forty million dollars in revenue. So it's a pretty daunting task that Central Rail Link, and I think that's probably the cornerstone of the fact that uh, we've overspent money, but that project has just been the icing on the cake that has really sunk the Auckland Council. This was predicted, really, wasn't it, by a lot of local body politicians who said that this was going to be a white elephant, that uh, it was going to you know, add huge costs. I mean, the numbers are staggering, $220 million a year to operate it with revenue of $40 million coming off that. No, and no, that... That, that, that's what that's what the Bernard Orsman wrote in the Herald: two hundred and twenty million a year to operate once it opens yeah. in twenty twenty six, less the forty million of the revenue that they'll get from it. Yes, but the, the ratepayers are in hock for two hundred and forty uh, two hundred and twenty million, and that's that, that's after the forty million of revenue has been taken out. So right, right, it's a daunting task and a daunting problem that the ratepayers of Auckland are going to have to get over. Yeah. But on the surface of it, this looks like there's no business case. Like if you've got costs of $220 million and revenue of just $40 million, you're never going to get ahead. I mean, the interest costs on the loans alone are $160 million per annum. Yes. Well, you know, that was always said. And I remember Dick Quacks, who was on the council with me for the first six years that I was there, mm. um, always used to say to the mayor, this is going to be a $6 billion project, Mr. Mayor. And he'd say, you're a naysayer, quacks. Uh, it won't be anything like that. Don't worry. Don't worry. Well, the chickens have come home to roost and uh, and poor old uh, Wayne Brown is now saddled with that. And uh, it's, it's dr- siphoned all the funds from other areas of council because that level of debt that the council's looking at down the barrel of is is a colossal uh, imposition. This all comes back to Len Brown's mayoralty, doesn't it? Uh, yes. I mean, who would ever have started a project of this magnitude without having a sign-off from the government of the day as to what they were going to contribute? And even, I think, Winston Peters he was saying with, he would put in something like seventy five percent of the um, of the cost of the project. That was back in well a- after the project started, and the project got underway uh, before any government sign off had been authorised. And Len started negotiating with precincts, precinct properties that bought the big building opposite the Britomart um, Rail station at the bottom of Queen Street so that he could then wanted to put the the two tunnels under that property that precinct have now built and finished and then run it up Albert Street and he started he he got precinct to sign up to put the put the uh, tunnels under that building and then he started the cut and cover up Albert Street and that's been going 
um, for uh, that was going for quite some time and before John Key came to the party and uh, and agreed to put in 50 percent. And that 50 percent came from Phil Goff and Phil Twyford back at the 2011 general election when Goff was the leader of the opposition standing for uh, to stand for the prime minister's position. He put up this offer of 50-50 split between Auckland the Council and the government in Wellington. And, uh, you know, and I actually sneaked along to his meeting just to hear what he was going to offer, and that's what he offered. And then in the following election, 2014, I actually confronted um, one of the others uh, who in the, in the government and he confirmed that they were still sticking to that 50-50 split. So it was obvious that but the cost of the thing was a lot less at that stage. It was about $2.4 billion, And obviously, it's just keep rising, and it's now up to uh, 5.4. So it's a great in, you know, impediment for Auckland at the present time. So you're saying, what's it like at the council? Every day when you're talking about anything, the issue of we've got no money keeps coming up. You know, I, I look back on that time and it seemed to me that Len Brown's plan was to get it started and then they'll it will force the government into having to cough up with it along the way. But there was never seemed to be any cost-benefit analysis done that was based on reality. I mean, if you've got 40 million revenue and costs of 220 million, it doesn't make sense. I can't make sense of it, but it's it's too late. The decisions are made and they're locked in and Aucklanders are now going to be facing, you know, double digit um, rates increases when every politician always promises 3% or less. Yeah, well, that, that, is, that is the issue. And I mean, Len knew that he was short on information as to what the project was overall going to cost. And uh, it was a more audacious project at that stage, because he's he also had a rail a deep down in the earth rail station at the top of Simon Street, and then that was and then he had the the station down at Mount Eden, which has now been changed, and that station at Mount Eden has taken over from what he was going to have at Simon Street. So he cut that out. He cut that whole station out, and then he also cut out. I think it was six hundred million dollars that he was going to spend to buy more rolling stock, electric rolling stock. So that when it opened, uh, he would have a, enough um, rolling stock to keep it going. So the whole project, that project, has cost Aucklanders and New Zealanders a huge amount of money because, as well as the CRL, there's been all the money that's been spent on the rolling stock and also um, the uh, upgrade of the tracks right across Auckland. So it, it you. No, I don't say that. I would say that very there would be very few understanding what the total cost of that project has cost altogether. But when you look at it, okay, it goes to South Auckland, and there's a lot of people that live in those those suburbs in South Auckland. It goes out to West Auckland, but it winds out around New Lynn. Then it goes to Fruitvale and Sunnyvale, and these places that people have never heard about. They've never heard of. And and eventually gets to Henderson and then gets up to Swanson out in the west. So and in the meantime, you've got all those people that live in places like Massey, the new area of Fanuapai, and they're miles away from that that train line, and they're now clamouring for a bus way that'll take them from Massey through to the Auckland city centre. So, which is which is what yeah. which is what people on the North Shore have is a bus way. Now you yeah. were you were involved in the early days of the busway. That's actually a successful public infrastructure project, isn't it? Yeah, look, I I, I pushed that project very hard, and it was in Helen Clark's when the Helen Clark was government was in place. Um, Mark Goshi was the Minister of Transport, and mm. he came to the party with the funding for that particular project. And so we we had signed up with the government well before the project started, um, as opposed to what's happened with the CRL. And, uh, you know, Len used to always put that back in my face saying, George, you've got your um, 
bus way over there. We deserve something like, we deserve decent transport in South Auckland and West Auckland. But the figures that he's talking about are huge compared to what we were talking about on the North Shore. We did it on the smell of an oily rag. He spent, they've spent mega bucks on the CRL project. Yeah, I mean, that bus, I mean, I don't use public transport. I, I'm one of these people who believes that public transport's for other people to use, but that's just my facetious way of dealing with things. I mean, at the moment, the only uh, that there's evidence that I do take public transport because I've got my picture plastered all over the back of, of buses at the moment that are running around, which I think is hugely funny. But that busway and the extension now out to Otiha Valley has removed all of that all those buses and you know also emergency vehicles can use the busway off the motorway. Um, you've also got all of the, you know, if you look at the car parks that are associated with each of those bus stations, they're always chocker. So it's a classic case of infrastructure that was well thought out, well planned, and has been embraced by um, the ratepayers as a, as a convenient way for them to get into the city. But yeah. why, why why didn't we do that with south of the bridge? Why did we build this rail system, which every time it rains, the trains stop. Uh, anytime there's a blockage, the trains stop. With buses and things like that, if there's a blockage, you can go around the blockage, but you can't do that with trains. It just seems illogical. And then we've got this addiction to rail um, out to the airport as well that they want to do. And that's just ridiculous. I'm, I'm just glad that the current government has, you know, knocked that on the head because that was stupidity extraordinaire. Well, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, Auckland as a city never um, took on commuter rail like they've done in Sydney, London, Paris, you know, big cities overseas. And we're now running um, freight trains on the same lines that the uh, metro trains run on. And uh, if a freight train breaks down, it causes all mayhem on, mm. on the uh, the metro for the metro passengers because the trains can't um, get up the line. So, um, and then what do they just, do when that happens? They put on buses. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> why don't we just yeah. build buses in the first place? You know. Well, that's been the, one of the problems with the system is that buses have had to be substituted for tr trains, and I bet they do it again over the Christmas holidays, which is what they do many weekends and over the holidays because. The whole thing has never been thought out and put in place properly. Um, you know, and what the cost of it is for the ratepayers will be a very interesting um, outcome of the whole thing, I think. I mean, you were a councillor uh, at the start of the Super City. Obviously, previously, you'd been the mayor of North Shore City. Do you think the Auckland Council, the new Super City, has delivered on the promises that the politicians made about it? Um, probably not at, at this stage. And with these debts that we're now being faced with, I would say that there's, it's, it's finally balanced as to, as to whether we are going to um, see the outcomes which the Royal Commission um, indicated that Auckland could see if it was done properly. And that's the problem, is that we got in there um, the mayor and his so, um, supporters saw that there was a lot of funds there. There was a lot of projects that they hadn't seen in, in the areas that they wanted to see development happening. So we had a lot of projects built in places um, on the, the whim of the mayor, um, which cost millions and millions of dollars. And coupled with the rail project and other projects of that ilk, um, this is really putting the pressure on um, the council and the ratepayers. And I think it's a major um, impediment that people are now having to deal with, and they're going to be dealing with it for many years to come. I mean, the, the, the Royal Commission said to us, and Rodney Hyde was the minister who implemented it, told us that there was going to be significant savings through economies of scale in a yes. whole range of areas where we would have um, a third less staff than the previous you know, individual cities combined. We now have more staff. Uh, we've got none of the savings. 
uh, and we've got rates increases on rates increases on rates increases, and we've had a, a succession of mayors who have promised the earth and delivered very little. What are we yeah, going to do uh, to actually solve this? And is Wayne Brown the guy that's going to fix it? I mean, he's told us he's the Mr. Fix It. Is is he capable of fixing this, or is it just too much of a problem and we need to start again somehow? Well, I think Wayne is in a bit of an invidious situation because he you, you saw it the last, last year when he was doing his annual plan. He wanted to sell all the airport shares, and unfortunately... Um, it never happened because the councillors wouldn't support him. And I think that that's the problem that Wayne is facing at the present time. He doesn't have the support of his councillors. And if you don't have that support, uh, it puts you in a very difficult situation. And, uh, you know, Wayne, um, I, don't, I don't think Wayne actually probably appreciated the gravity of the situation that he was going to be getting himself into. And he's now there, and um, it's it's very difficult to um, try and sell assets. Uh, he's trying to sell, he's talking about more um, airport shares, but he's also telling talking about selling the business down at, um, at the Port of Auckland. Um, you know, and they're also trying to sell every bit of land they can put their hands on at the moment, trying to balance the books. So that's council land that they own, and um, they've been doing it since Len Brown's days, but it just seems that the pressure's come on stronger now than it was previously. There's a lot of systemic problems from an outsider looking in at Auckland Council, and, you know, I look at the processes that everybody, you know, there's an annual budget, then there's a 10-year budget process, and it seems like the 10-year budget process happens every year. Can can you explain that a little bit if you no, no, the 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 10-year budget is the the plan as to how Auckland's going to spend its funding or money, money over the next 10 years. But the plan is updated every three years. Right. So it's it's being updated at the present time so that it can be start the next 10 years um, next year. And, and so that's what uh, Wayne Brown is doing right now. And then in the intervening um, years bet between establishing the new long-term 10-year plan, they do a kind of a just a, a mini catch-up of any, any expenditure they want to add to the budget, um, and that goes for the next two the year two and year three. A year one, two, yeah. So in the intervening period, it's that mini budget that happens, but everything must be put into that budget that's that's going to be spent um, for that for that spending to happen over the next ten years. So things like development levies, all projects have to be in there because the council take development levies from people that are developing land building houses, changing your place, you've got to pay a, a levy to the council for capital costs. And all those uh, capital costs must be in that 10-year budget. So um, those bean counters are able to put down what the rate of the rate increase for the next 10 years will be. And that's how you can say it's going to be 7.5% in the year coming up. Then three is at three and a half percent, and then eight percent in the third year, and then then they'll redo another budget. But you know, people can't live in a world where you're paying is it about nineteen percent over three years? Um, and you know, we've been paying increased rates or targeted rates. Phil Goff bought in the way of of saying that he wasn't putting the rates up more than a certain figure by bringing in targeted rates like the uh, water quality targeted rate, yeah. um, the targeted rate for looking after natural resources out in the bush, and then the rubbish targeted rate. All those targeted rates, they they don't get included in that percentage increase. So there's a bit of a myth there. It's and, a flim flam, isn't it? It's it's, yeah. it's actually a fraud on the ratepayers. Well, it is a it is a it is a fraud in what they say they're going to do. And what it, how it ends up. So 
people believe that it's going to be, say, 7.5% if, if what Wayne Brown's proposed at this stage comes to pass, but there could be other increases that'll happen as well. And rubbish, rubbish disposal is one where there are a number of different rates uh, in order to uh, make up or to, to balance the books with that activity of council. And you would know that you have a, a rubbish collection for uh, recyclables or papers and cans and that kind of stuff. Then you have another one these days for kitchen waste, which goes all the way to Reparoa to be processed. And then you have another one for solid waste. And it, despite the fact you also have to put a tag on your rubbish bin when it goes out, but that doesn't cover all the costs. So in the past, there's been uh, it's been a situation where there's been competition in that rubbish collection business. You've had companies like Enviro Waste, Waste Management, other companies have been going around and they've been competing against the council. And the council found, found themselves very vulnerable over that. So now they've decided that they'll charge those funds with a, a, another increase on your rates so that the, it'll eliminate those private contractors or rubbish collectors because everyone will have to pay a rate and no one's going to pay a rate and then go and get a private contractor. So Enviro Waste, they're pulling out, I think it's by about April next year, because they obviously realise that the council is going to make it impossible for them to complete in, compete in the rubbish marketplace. Mm. So that kind of thing um, is where the poor pe person out there in, in the territories uh, is getting knocked all the time for, for more money from the council. It, it, rubbish has always been a bugbear for me. When I lived in Whangapara, we didn't have any council rubbish collection. We had to pay for our own bins to to be collected. And then when I moved into the North Shore area, um, I had to buy tags for rubbish. But when I was a kid and, you know, living in Epsom and places like that, we never paid for rubbish. The council came and collected it, and it's, they still collect it. And there's this disparity between south of the bridge rubbish collection and north of the bridge rubbish collection where people north of the bridge have to pay extra to have their rubbish taken away when everybody else south of the bridge gets their rubbish taken away anyway no it's not it's not like that you pay it in your rates in the old Auckland council area yeah we didn't pay it here well we didn't pay it here when we had to pay a tag or buy buy a bin or buy a bag from the supermarket yeah yeah, yeah. so it was Probably there was some equalisation there, but then in South Auckland, uh, in in the in, in the old Manukau area, they get they dished out big plastic bags, and they could put out as many bags as they wished. So there wasn't any unified or uniform system of, of collection of rubbish across Auckland. And what they've been trying to do is try to find ways to kind of unify the system so that. Everybody gets the same yeah. same deal, but that it's it's been it's proven to be beyond their capabilities to do it because it was such a big difference. And also, Auckland and Manukau had that busy um, where they sorted out the uh, the the, um, the the recyclables. The, yeah, the recyclables out at Anihanga, and that had a big different made it different out there so we never had that on the north shore but it all each area seemed to work reasonably well but they after 12 or 13 years they still haven't cracked it as to how they're going to make it more equitable um in each of the areas difficult i mean there's all these pressures that are coming on the budget and if i look back at the lynn brown years there's a couple of white elephants that stand out from his mayoralty. The first one is, of course, the central rail loop, which is enormous costs. But the other one is this fanciful canoe centre that he wanted built at uh, at Manukau. And every time I drive past there, I sort of crane my neck and look over from the motorway to see if I can see even one person canoeing around that place. And I'm yet to see anybody in it. Yeah. How are these projects established, funded? On what basis, what sort of cost-benefit ratio is there? Or is it just, you know, um, build it and they'll come mentality? 
which then fails abjectly. It, it seems well, ridiculous, and, we, and we're now paying the costs of 13 years of these boondoggles. Well, you know, um, Len obviously promised a number of organisations and people funds when he was campaigning against John Banks back in 2010. Hmm. And, he, and the kind of projects were um, the Auckland Theatre Company. They, built, they were building a building down in the um, Winyard Quarter. And which has been built and and next to the ASB building down there, um, a beautiful theatre. Um, Len was, I think, it was ten million dollars he had promised he'd put into that, and uh, that came to pass. Len put in uh, there was the the uh, Whitewater canoeing um, centre out at the uh, Manukau Centre. He obviously put that. I think I think Dick Quacks used to say it was forty million dollars. And Dick was hot to trot on that, and Len, Len still went ahead and did it. And then there were others. Um, you know, you've got me thinking now, but they, there were others that he had. I remember he came back once and said that he was going to put three. I think it was three million dollars into the Anglican Church at the top of Parnell, and uh, he got us all to go up there. And they gave us a, a, a look around and showed us what a great project it was. I didn't support it. Um, because uh, it was another thing that he just wanted to do it on an ad hoc basis. And you can't do make fish a fowl of one and fowl of another, which is the way he kind of wanted to operate, unfortunately. And, you know, the, it, and the CRL has um, really shown that um, he, he made some major mistakes, I think. And that whitewater rafting thing, that was a sop to one of his donors in reality. Um, who coincidentally happened to run a company that need, that sold concrete, and of course the Whitewater Centre needed a lot of concrete. Yeah, it, I it, don't, I, it, it, it didn't yeah. seem to ever make sense, um, and yet it was pushed uh, very, very hard. Uh, it was lobbied for. It was heroic. The uh, the business case for it, and I remember looking into it at the time. And think, my word, what on earth is going on here? But now we've got the costs of it. Yeah, look, I don't know. I haven't had anything to do with that since I left the, the governing body over in the city. But, um, you know, I don't know if we put any money into that. But I, I do know that, you know, things like Eden Park, they were trying to build a stadium out there for the Rugby World Cup in 2011. And uh, Len was very supportive of um, Eden Park. Uh, and I think the council put in, they put in quite a lot of money into that, which I think may be still on their books at the present time. So, you know, and that's, and the stadium um, are very costly, especially Eden Park, which isn't owned by the council. It's a, it's a standalone trust, but um, the, the council, for Auckland Council especially, have been very generous to them. And now we are looking down the gun of, um, what they're going to do at North Harbour Stadium because they say that North Harbour Stadium is costing them too much and can't be sustained into the future. So, um, yeah, it's it's there's a bit of unfairness, I think, on occasions. Yeah, and Stadia is uh, huge white elephants. They almost never make money. Um, and yet we've, we're hearing now proposals of another stadium um, being proposed down the waterfront. Yeah, How although many that billions sounds, is that going to cost? Yeah, I think that may be a more of a private um, um, activity. But you know, Mount Mount Smart needs a lot of work done to it. I understand because mm. it's been there for a long time. It wasn't that was built for the the um, Commonwealth Games? The Commonwealth Games, yeah, yeah. So it's been there for for a long time, and it needs a lot of really um, major work done on it to bring it up to scratch. So. That's one stadium that we've got. Eden Park's the other, which uh, you know, it's not, it's never getting crowds to its capacity from for rugby um, matches at these days. But it, so they are really concentrating on the on the concerts out there, and uh, oh, all the best to them if they can do it. Yeah, they just need um, Helen Clark to die, and then they'll have all the problems with all the protests stop. She seems to be the architect of all of those. Well, there's there's other people out there as well, though. But I think they may have been worn down to some extent. They, I mean, they got their consent to have concerts, which is 
a, a, a breakthrough for Eden Park. Mm. Um, yeah, and yeah, so I, I would support them if they can make it work with a, a, and do it lawfully, you know, with a resource consent, which is what they've got now. I mean, I guess they've got to make the best of what they've got. They've got a stadium. What can we use stadiums for? Well, they're good for football matches. They're good for concerts. They're good for, you know, events with large numbers. But Eden Park isn't exactly a, a prime location for, uh, no, you know, with, with ready parking that's available. Unlike you know the stadium at Albany, you know that's that's a much more conducive stadium for large concerts, etc. Yeah, well, it, it, it just seems that they haven't had the opportunities at Albany. And, um, you know, when, when you look at um, the stadium at Waikato Stadium in Hamilton, mm. that was kind of modelled. They came to Auckland when I was the mayor and, and looked at North Harbour because they wanted a similar stadium in, in Hamilton. And, uh, you know, they've been very successful. And, and when you see the crowds that turn up there for mm. rugby games, um, they're on, they're, they've obviously got a better way of doing it there than we've got in Auckland because rugby just can't get the crowds along at the moment. Yeah, well, they may, maybe that's because they've what I call pussified it. They've made it for soft, you know, it's all soft people. You're not allowed to have, you know, strong tackles and that anymore. And you've got all the referees jumping in and the, you know, the the video refs stopping the game. And it's it's not exactly fun to watch rugby anymore. Yeah, except, yeah, except, Hamilton and um, Christchurch, Dunedin, they get they reasonable right. crowds. Yeah, yeah. Mind you, you could argue there's nothing else to do in Hamilton or Christchurch at night. <laughs> well, it's also getting getting to Eden Park is not the easiest, is it? No. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not easy in Auckland at the moment. Yeah, there's been a few problems in relation to transport, although I think Auckland Transport have made major improvements here. I think they've got a long way to go. I mean, I live in Takapuna now, and the carnage that happens around here as a result of Auckland Transport, you know, with uh, the half-million-dollar pedestrian crossings, the 30-kilometre-an-hour zones, the ripping up of Hurstmere Road to put in a cycleway, uh, all of this nonsense, and it's just killed off, uh, you know, all of these business areas around here. and and you know, your enjoyment of life because it's being sucked out of you by road cones and, you know, all of these extra things that are happening on the road all around you. It, it, and there's no evidence to support that they're stopping anything untoward anyway. Yeah, but but Cam, I mean, I'm, I represent you on the Devonport Takabuna Local Board. Um, uh, we, um, you know, I don't think Takabuna and, and, and this area is too bad. And it's, it's always an area that people wish to come to and and um, put down their roots. I mean, it's uh, I, th- I think it's 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 reasonable. And you know, in, in Auckland Council um, studies they do or uh, surveys, it always comes out pretty high up on the list of where people are reasonably satisfied with the way mm. things go on here. So. Um, you know, I agree, and it gets up my nose, that cycle lane through Esme Road and Takapuna. Um, and you wouldn't believe it, but the, when I was I was on the board a few years ago, that came up, Auckland Transport brought it to us, and we voted against having that cycle lane through Takapuna. And I think um, it's it's been a major um, negative factor in Esme Road because... Who wants to go to Hurstmere Road? And you go to walk across the road and you don't look to your right to, as to whether there's any cyclists coming. Next thing, a cyclist right on top of you. So no, and that no, happens. No. I have to stop you there, George. There's never a cyclist on that. So you're perfectly oh. safe to walk across the road. It's, you know, you're never, you're never going to be in danger of being hit by a cyclist you know, in, in a month of Sundays. No, you come down. I'll come down to Leaf and Loaf one day and t- have a talk to the guy there and have a cup of tea. Or a cup <laughs> of tea. And I think I think um, you'd hear that that they do come through there, but he also gets guys on electric scooters and and even yeah. motorbikes go through. So it's 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 not good for um, for people that are down there shopping with their kids and all of a sudden you got a bike down on you coming down on you. Yeah. But let's talk about um, Takapuna or, or the North Shore Ward. 
What yeah. is it with the voters in North Shore Ward that they keep ret- um, retaining Chris Darby and Richard Hills, a couple of lefty wombles who want to spend moonbeams on cycleways and anything else that's so remotely green or womble-like, and they keep getting voted in? Uh, it's It staggers me that someone like you can't actually get across the line yeah. when you used to be the mayor in North Shore. It's, is well, that... I did get I did get it across the line to start with in the mm. first two two terms. I beat Derby in the first um, election in two thousand and ten. Mm. I actually topped the poll in that in that election, um, and there was quite a raft of good candidates. But yeah, I agree, and I think it. I get, I put it down to the fact that they've got name recognition. Um, people don't care too much about voting in local government elections. And you get, but you get a lot of people um, who are of their persuasion voting, and that's how they they get a reasonable I mean, R- good Richard number Hills, of votes. Richard Hills is a Labour Party member, and he and his signs that he puts up around here during the election are always blue. Same with Chris Darby, always yeah. always blue. They're dishonest, and they're hoodwinking the people into thinking that they're. You know, the uh, conservatives were in actual fact they're complete lefty wombles, and and they're as much part of the problem in the city with expenditure as anybody else because they're always on the side of these big spending projects. You know, Derby well, and Hills were pushing for that cycle bridge across the harbour. You know, for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you there, but they they are um, they got great name recognition. Mm. Um, they've been there for a while, um, and they're pretty hard campaigners. Um, as you say, they use um, an, an off blue colour for their signs. Um, they they actually are very clever at um, corralling the um, you know the social media mm. um, in the right places. They're on the Herald website um, with their stuff, and and I think they're. Probably uh, that because they've done it for the first for the last three years together and they've been successful. Um, yeah. I think that they it's that name recognition is their biggest factor that gives them a an edge over other people. But with both um, North Shore and the Northcote Ward in national hands, you would think that somebody from the right centre right would be able to crack it as opposed to what we've had in the last number of elections here. Well, that's a perennial problem that I've always had a beef with, with the National Party, uh, not involving themselves in local body elections and allowing all of these disparate groups to form all around the place, um, rather than having the Labour Party uh, has their candidates, the Green Party has their candidates. Um, Sometimes they call it city vision, but you're under no illusions as to what they are. And yet, citizens and ratepayers, or whatever they call themselves now, never seem to get their act together and seem to be still stuck in the old pre twenty ten, uh, you know, city boundaries of Auckland, and don't uh, get a cohesive ticket across the entire city. And I think that would be, that would solve part of that problem. But I think somebody in, needs to grab the president of the National Party and and the board and start banging some heads together because they just seem unwilling to to involve themselves in any sort of political campaigning in a coherent manner across the city. But you take, yeah, okay, you take the the two wards north of the Harbour Bridge. I mean, Sayers and Rodney, he's he's home and hose. He's done very well up there keeping, keeping that seat. Yep. Walker and Watson, in, I don't think they're aligned with centre-right. And then you've got these other two here. I mean, but centre-right have put up people against Wayne Walker and John Watson. They didn't do any good. And the same happened here. So, yeah, I think it probably is going to take the National Party to do what the Labour Party do and align themselves with the lo- like city vision is aligned to the Labour Party yeah. and the Green Party. They do very well, and and I think something over here has to happen, and it's it's long overdue. But no, no, the National Party don't seem to want to get involved. Yeah, no, I mean John Watson and Wayne Walker 
have become conservatives, which is kind of interesting. If you look at their history, they're kind of like green type guys, but um, have become fiscally conservative. And they're often against some of these big spending projects that you see in the voting uh, of the councillors. Um, they're more aligned with Morris Williamson and Sharon Stewart and people like that uh, than they are opposed to um, you know, what those guys subscribe to. So, I mean, but I think I'm, there's a little bit of cohesiveness there, but the one that's the, the head scratcher for me is, you know, Richard Hills and Chris Darby constantly getting elected in, in around Takapuna North Shore. Just, uh, it just, I just can't understand it. And you're right, it's, it's to do with name recognition and that, but goodness me, somebody needs to do something about it. But those guys have, they, Wayne Wayne Brown. I mean, I don't know what Wayne's politics are. Wayne um, Walker. He, no, Wayne Brown, the mayor. Oh yeah, yep. And he he's taken Richard Hill and given him uh, at one of his all of council committees, um, and he's got a pretty big job that he that they all say oh, he's doing a great job now. Uh, and then you got Chris Darby. He's just appointed him to Auckland Transport. So no, he's um, exactly the worst person to appoint Auckland Transport. Yeah, look, I I don't disagree with you on that, <laughs> but um, I don't want to get into the I don't want to get into the personalities of these things. No, you but, don't, yeah. but I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so yeah, I, look, it, it it seems to me that Auckland Council has terrible issues, not just budget wise, but a legacy of not actually delivering what the Royal Commission uh, envisaged or indeed the politicians that promised us these amazing things. And I don't know if there's any solution to fixing that other than maybe just splitting the two, the, the, the city in two. I don't know. But what, is, well, what we've got now isn't working. Well, what they were trying to do was to join – Devonport Takapuna up with Kaipataki, but they they I don't know if they're pushing ahead with that at this stage, maybe for the next election, but uh and making it one one board and they'd probably go to other boards and do the same thing. But um that's not going to get you very far, really. Uh it, it, as far as the centre right are concerned, you you mentioned Sharon Stewart and Morris Williamson out there, Daniel Newman yep. in um Manurewa. Um, there's not a lot of other there's, in, there's not a lot of others. Dersley, I don't know where she stands on some things. She's C and R, but um, you know, she's she's really um, the deputy mayor now, and she's pretty uh, much a supporter of the mayor. But I never know. I couldn't tell you where he stands either. So it's it's very difficult um, um, going right across Auckland to to find where C and R just haven't cut the mustard really unfortunately no and and that's a, a serious you know systemic issue that exists within the center right in in auckland that i mean morris morris williamson and and sharon stewart they stayed as independents yeah. um maybe that's what we should have done on the shore but anyway yeah. we didn't and a bit but um camp to make a do a successful um, campaign, and I probably won't do it again. But you've got to um, you've got to work very hard at it. You've got to, you know, this business of door knocking. It is something which you've got to be doing. You've got to just do it and grin and grin and bear it, and get the get people to say they'll support you. Now, if you don't do that, sending out brochures and and just putting your name up ain't going to be enough. No. So it's 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 really where the whole thing starts and finishes. Yeah. But see, that's where, you know, people like yourself who came up, you know, you've actually worked in a real job. <laughs> you know, you used to yeah. be a cop. You know, you yeah. know what knocking yeah. on doors is all about. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we seem to be, you know, we seem to have lost the ordinary person standing for council. Is that, you know, maybe that's the reason why we've got these career politicians that never seem to give us any solutions because they haven't actually worked in the real world. And and also I think that the officers of council, you know, look upon the elected representatives as just temporary. They'll be here for, for the three years and a lot of them will be gone, so don't worry about them too much. And you don't get 
these days the colourful characters who do their own thing and stand up against the what they're told as far as how they've got to do this and do that. I mean, you'd find it very difficult to uh, be given your uh, writing instructions. Mm-hmm. And don't forget, these days, if you if you do transgress the rules or you get you, you get yourself nose out of joint, you'll end up with a code of conduct complaint against you. And that can be, you know, you say, well, so what? But <laughs> it's a black mark against you because everybody will know and they'll just put it around and you've got to try and get yourself out of it. Yeah. Yeah, and I've suffered that, and uh, it's it's not very pleasant to uh, have to get you uh, to try and find a way of getting through it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, we I think we need more people like you, um, George, on the council or certainly on the local boards. People who actually know their ass from their elbow, to to use a colloquial term, um, because you know these career politicians aren't doing anything for us and uh, they're making things worse. And, and, you know, we've just outlined today for the listeners, huge boondoggles that have cost millions and millions of dollars. And the people responsible for those things sailed off into the distance and there's no accountability because they're gone. Well, it's interesting. I was watching television the other night and uh, they were talking about the uh, homosexual law reform bill. And Norman Jones, remember Norman Jones? Yeah. Remember Cargill? Yeah. <laughs> he got up and ripped into from an audience and saying what he thought and about the um, Fran Wilde's um, bill that she had before Parliament. He lost, of course, but um, mm. uh, he, he, he stood his ground. And you need people that are prepared to put themselves on the line and um, and make a stand on things, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it would help too if councillors knew the, w- which end of a shovel to hold. You know, that's the problem is that they've never actually been on the tools. They've never actually done anything with their hands. They've never actually run businesses. They've just sort of been consultants and then become politicians and now they're you know inflicting rates increases on us all. I don't yeah. know what the solution is, but maybe we need to just go back to the basics and have, you know, good, honest um, people who are not making this a career and are treating it as actually, you know, community service. Maybe yeah, that's, the, think, maybe that's I, the issue. I think you're probably right there, but finding those people is a difficulty. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm working with a guy on the local board that we stood stood together and got elected, and uh, he, he's got his own business, so he, he has to put his business activities aside to come to meetings. Yeah. But... Um, Man, he he puts a different perspective on issues because he's got that business way of thinking, yeah. and you know can say, well, what's the what's the benefit cost ratio here? You know, we haven't done it. What what, what are we going to get out of this for putting this money in? And we we've only got a very limited amount of money. We can't do it, and because count, um, elected representatives are always wanting to please people, and. Um, and that's that's actually one of the interesting things when you get elected. When I got elected first as the mayor of North Shore City, I used to hate offending people, but eventually <laughs> you learn that you can't please everybody, and yeah. you can. You, there's going to be a lot of people you just have to, you know, say, "Well, I'm not going to help you. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Your, your idea is not the way I'm thinking on this." And uh, you know, when people. People like you when you treat them harshly quite quite often because you're you're honest with them and you tell them as it is. And I always think that that's one of the the realities of being a politician that you have to learn learn it the hard way and you'll get there in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you have to learn to say no to people and and be strong about it. Um, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. But we don't seem to have anybody who is. Doing that, I mean, how on earth does Auckland Transport justify a half a million dollars for a pedestrian crossing? I mean, there's two of them within 50 metres of each other in Takapuna, one on Hurstmere Road and one on Anzac Street, They're those raised ones. half That's a million dollars in the space of, you know, 50-odd metres. Yeah. Uh, why didn't anybody say, no, that's stupid? It's the same like with your with the Hurstmere Road cycleway, right? You yeah, all said yeah. everybody said no, but there it is. And and well, this is this is what yeah. staggers me is that 
who asked for these things? Because it wasn't me. Well, they claim that it's it's going to stop deaths on the roads because they say that people, if you're hit by a car and the car's only doing 30K, um, the chances of you you dying as a result of that collision are very limited. That's, what, but, that's but their this theory. Is abs- but this is absurd. I mean, why don't they then say, all right, then, let's make everybody drive around at 20 kilometres an hour and let's have a guy run in front <coughs> with, a, with a little flag warning you that the car's coming because that's the level of absurdity that we're at now. Well, we are. It, it is It is something which these people have got ingrained into their psyche and there's no way that they're going to change. And I think that Simeon Brown, the new Minister of Transport, he's going to have a huge uh, imposition placed on him and he, he's got to try and make it work. And I see him talking about the um, Auckland petrol tax the other day mm. and he and it's the, the media kind of sense that he hasn't made a decision as to when it's going to be withdrawn. But there's a hang of a lot of people that are looking at him to do it because people are hurting, but it's just a symbolic kind of um, gesture. If Get rid of that 10 cents plus GST and um, it'll show that the government's doing something to try and help us in this time of you know high cost of living. Well, so, I mean, the, the reason that was put on was to fund the rail expansion, which was now being cancelled. So there's no actual rationale for that petrol tax to be there now. It needs to go, and it was a, a promise that they delivered, and he needs to to um, actually get on with it. Yeah, well, I don't know what, what the time frame is going to be, but it didn't sound as if it was going to be tomorrow. Um, it's, it's just... You know what politicians are like, George? They're addicted yeah. to taxation. <laughs> Once it's on, it's very hard to take off. That's what Dick Quacks used to always say. Once you put on a temporary tax, it's never going to go. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, on that note, yeah. George, look, we've had a lovely chat, and um, I don't know if we've solved any problems, but we've certainly rattled a few cages. And, okay, uh, Ken. Thank you for your time, and well, thank you for coming on The Crunch. Okay, all the best, Ken. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, that certainly was interesting. George thinks that many of the problems in Auckland Council can be sheeted home to large white elephant projects instigated by Len Brown, namely the Central Rail Loop, which is going to cost Aucklanders $220 million a year to operate. We are sorely missing people like George Wood at council level. Don't forget to send comments on George's interview to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email.